Okay guys, welcome back to the channel. Gonna do something I rarely do on this channel. Actually do an equipment review. <laughs> I really steer clear of that uh, as part of my focus on this channel. Obviously I do anecdotal reviews at shows, my friend's systems, products at dealers, give some anecdotal reports, but nothing like a thorough review. I just don't enjoy taking in gear on loan and uh, putting it in, taking it out and doing all that stuff. There was a time when I probably would have loved doing that. It's just not of my interest right now, especially when you get everything dialed in. The last thing you want to do is change things out. But I do do reviews occasionally on products that I own, like the Mini DSP, the GR Research in Extreme, the Bach, and that I buy and I keep. <laughs> you know, I rarely change out gear. You've probably never seen main pieces in my gear in the last couple of years that I've changed out. I basically just added things like the bog, room treatments, all these other things. Uh, but one thing I, I wanted to review is something I bought while I was at the Toronto Audio Fest, which is the Musical Fidelity A1. And if you were watching or have been following a while, you'll know that a couple reasons why I bought this. Number one is I own the original British Fidelity A1 from circa 1985. It was my first amp ever. And so when I saw that they re-released it, there were multiple reasons why uh, I wanted to buy it. Well, not to mention, the, the first off was just nostalgia purposes. I thought it'd be cool to have it on a shelf and just have my first amp kind of as a display piece. Like a lot of people have a lot of extra gear in their house or stored uh, as an audiophile and to use, you know, occasionally. But also when I bought this piece, it was more than just nostalgia. This piece was responsible for me probably staying in the hobby. When you're young, and I was only like 16 at the time, and just starting out, it's very easy. You jumped from hobby to hobby as a kid, and if you have a bad experience right off the bat, then you kind of ditch it. You, you, you got OCD. You go to another thing, especially when you have as much free time as you do as a teenager. But so this piece really put me on the right path of having a great first experience, good value, and I just enjoyed the piece so much for so many years. I basically kept it until it couldn't work anymore, and then I, I didn't even sell it. I gave it to my brother, and I think my brother, I don't know what he did with it, but it was just a phenomenal piece. Although, over the years, some of the things that made it a budget piece uh, began to reveal its... Uh, you know, wear and tear in terms of the volume control was very poor on the first one. You had to sometimes grease the thing, it was scratchy, and it just was a poor volume control. Obviously, it ran very hot. I got used to that part of it. And if you bought speakers that weren't efficient, then you could hear the warts of it being limited at 20 watts, 25 watts per channel, if you wanted to do dynamic uh, material loud on certain type speakers. So when I moved on, I really didn't, and I moved on to McCormick, been very happy ever since then with them. And I never looked back from the standpoint of the versatility <coughs> and the, the, the sonic profile of the McCormicks with most of the gear that I have bought since then. But I have always, in the back of my mind, been thinking, what if they re-released that first amp? Because it just had a certain sweetness to it. Speaking of the word sweetness, that's audiophile jargon, but I have never heard any time in the hobby for any product in my 40 plus years, one audiophile jargon term applied to a piece of product uh, universally. And the word sweetness, sweet sounding, sweet, is almost every review you ever hear of this amp it always says sweet. It's just so obvious to people. Uh, there's no debate. This isn't one of these amps that... You know, certain AB amps, class AB amps that you do, you can't tell the difference. Sometimes even tube amps, you can't tell the difference. Sometimes even comparisons of tube to solid state, it's a little bit hard sometimes to tell the difference. You put this in your system, you will hear a difference, I'm pretty sure, uh, benchmarking it against anything. And in fact, I'm going <laughs> to, let's cut to the chase of this review. Uh, I'm going to talk about some of the metrics and all the stuff you normally talk about in a review. But here's the litmus test. I'm in Houston. <laughs> Anybody who's got any amp, especially these perfect measuring amps like Benchmark or a Halcro from back in the day that supposedly had zero distortion um, and these best signal to noise ratios, or even these mega amps now with these monster chassis, all this kind of crazy stuff. 
If you have one of these amps and at least a fair fight, some somewhat efficient speakers, I am willing to bring this over and I want to have a bunch of audio files come over and us do a blind test of this to one of those perfect measuring amps or massive power amps just to see what people say, what they choose when we ask the simple question, what do you think sounds better? What do you enjoy more? Because I'm very interested in what would come out of such a comparison. That's how addictive, at the bottom line, it's just an addictive, relaxed, sweet sounding, perfect combination for a lot of people. I can't say perfect for everybody. But for me, it has that combination of solid state bass, dynamic contrast that you want with the sweetness of tubes, that warm, relaxed nature that just is inviting. It, there's amps that you can't listen to for a long time with most modern day speakers, especially hot tweeter speakers that aren't full range and balanced, or you don't have the ability to DSP it to your taste or to something more neutral. That's what a lot of people's problems are. You know, they've got the wrong amp with the wrong speaker and nothing in their room or DSP to fix it. And then they listen to maybe four or five songs at best and then they're not tired. Uh, they can't listen for hours. Not only can you listen for hours with this amp, at least on my rig and my gear, you want to. And that's the other litmus test. There's some that you can't, there's some that you can listen for hours, but then there's some very rare products that make you want to listen for hours. And no matter what type of material you play, classical, EDM, I mean, I played Ratchet at 90 plus dB volume with this, had no problem. Now, a few caveats. This is only a 20, let's go through the basics real quick before, so you know that off the bat. It's only like 20, 25 watts, class A, but it has a sliding bias to class B to now give more power than I think the original did and a much bigger transformer. So I think that was the biggest delta that I noticed right off the bat is that bass and um, dynamic contrast are extremely good with this, so surprising. Uh, and like I said, I think it'll be comparable with almost anything you put it up against. Um, whatever they're doing, phenomenal job. Better transformer, I think, than the 85 version. And whatever minor changes they've made to give it a little more oomph. That was the major problem with it. Other than the volume control over time, the heat, um, on certain inefficient speakers, uh, the bass could get distorted or loose because um, it just didn't have enough juice to power the, some of these speakers. But I don't think that's the case now. Now, I do have the advantage, the caveat, like I mentioned, I roll off my GR Research and Extremes, and these are very efficient speakers on their own. But I re relieve them of having to do anything, you know, at 20 hertz, 30 hertz. Um, and these speakers on their own don't even really go down that low, but if you give that information, it's going to try to produce it. And your amp is going to try. I roll it off, and that's a big caveat that probably is part of the equation of why I think this is so good. But if you've got uh, efficient speakers and want to A, B this, I, I want to see what type of speakers, you know, unless you have Apogees or Sound Labs or Acoustats or something crazy, uh, MBL Extremes, you know, I want to see how far we can go with this amp being able to drive certain speakers. So if you're in Houston, I want to, uh, I want to bring this to your house if you're if you're you know interested let me know because the other thing that this has not only the ability to drive a lot of speakers it has the sound quality that I think is going to be so addictive to people like I say in a blind test I want to see but to explain a little more detail the word sweet applies but that's kind of nebulous audiophile jargon how can I explain it in terms that would help you better. Well, obviously you got to use some analogies and you know, the word etched is a common problem I hear with a lot of systems. A lot of systems are too etched and it's a combination of, yes, a distortionless amplifier shouldn't sound that way with most uh, speakers that are properly designed, but a lot of speakers are intentionally tilted up. And one thing that we're going to hear about, and in fact, Edgar even mentioned it in his Zoom interview about some you know, the, the natural loss of, low, of high frequency information is okay in a room 
some of that roll off to our ears. There's a lot of psychoacoustic things. And if you don't, if you have too much high frequency information or too much, uh, quote, neutrality, it really isn't neutral to your ears and your ear pinna. And it becomes very fatiguing. And so with this, whatever formula is in this amp, you immediately hear a more relaxed presentation. Now, the knee-jerk reaction, and I am guilty of it, um, but the knee-jerk reaction is to call it less detailed and to call it uh, a little too warm or syrupy. But as you listen to it more and more, you kind of realize maybe everything else is wrong <laughs> and this is right. It's just a level of once you hear acoustic instruments like horns and even cymbals and you hear it in acoustic and then you hear it in EDM, you start realizing I'm not missing any details actually. It's presented a little differently. Uh, it's maybe presented in a more relaxed, but sometimes it, it just seems more real. <laughs> and so at the end of the day, and addictive on top of that. So when you have those two qualities, it's just a it's the best of the worlds that people like with tube equipment, but the bass control and dynamic contrast of solid state. And so that's what's so amazing about this circuit design, which was done by Tim DeParavinci. If you're not familiar with him, he was a legend in the industry. Unfortunately, he passed away a few years ago. I wish I would have um, interviewed him before he passed away because actually, I, one of the people I trust the most and as a legend himself is Steve McCormick. And he makes the amps that I pivoted to after the British Fidelity A1 back in the day. And of the people that he respects in the industry, one of the top of the list when I asked him one day, it was Tim Taparavinci. And he's one of those guys that was, you know, interesting fellow, but he um, was successful at certain pieces he created were lustworthy in terms of their performance and went up in value, kind of like a John Curl phono stage and uh, Tim DeVaravinci did some phono stages that were legendary. You know, there's so many pieces nowadays with ridiculous price tag, huge chassis, you know, and immediately nobody pays full retail. And then as soon as you get it home, you can't sell it for what you even paid for it. And they're not going up in price. Um, this is the case where certain designers have that ability to create a product that resonates with so many people that it, it, that it just stands the test of time. And just the fact that they're re-releasing this since 1985. I mean, Muse Fidelity has made tons of products since then. Why are they re-releasing the one from 1985? This just has a unique formula that is unmistakable when you listen to it. Like I said, everybody uses the same jargon to describe it. And I think that I think there's a, a good review online. I got to give credit to somebody that I really haven't given credit to. I, I don't talk about other reviewers or YouTubers anyways. I don't like to get into the drama and all that passive aggressive stuff that people do. But here I'll give props that at one time I stopped watching Steve Gutenberg because he was talking about Klipsch all the time. And I figured that based on what I've heard of Klipsch, it just didn't sync with what he was saying about clips and how his ears heard it. So I just felt we were on different polar ends of the spectrum and I stopped watching his stuff. But sure enough, as soon as I started talking in my membership group about the Music Fidelity A1, and then I go to YouTube, pops up, first video shows it, because YouTube, I mean, your phone tra tracks everything you do. <laughs> Be careful, everything you say, it knows. And so anyway, YouTube popped up a video from Steve Gutenberg on the Music Fidelity A1. And so I watched it. And he, I think he reviewed it about a month ago. And I got to say, he hit the nail on the head. I would encourage you to, if you want more details and from a professional reviewer who likes to go into the nuances and comparisons and whatnot, uh, I would go ahead and watch his video to uh, get a good second opinion of what it sounds like. And I have to agree with most everything he says. Like he says, it's he thinks it's not the most detailed um, and um, amp, but... And I would agree with him on the surface, but that's the one thing that I keep questioning in my head is really what details am I missing? You know, I have amps that are a window on the performance and require your associated gear to be top notch, your room and everything dialed in to get that highest ceiling of transparency and performance. But I don't feel like I'm missing anything with this. It's definitely a, a more relaxed presentation, a more liquid and warm um, like you get with tubes, but 
you're not missing the dynamic contrast either. You got that bass slam. The bass, I would say, is a little more less pitch definition and textured and more oomph. But for a lot of people, and I've listened to a lot of people listen to different speakers and heard what they say afterward, a lot of people prefer that. More oomph, more control, but oomph to bass than the pitch definition and, and detail uh, that may be a little less oomph to it. That's where people will easily differ in their taste profile. This one will give you a little more of that oomph, a little less of the texture and pitch definition that a certain other amp will. But that extra oomph uh, actually matches well with the sweetness of the top end. So the real key is not so much analyzing this amp on you know, different metrics and breaking it down on that level. The real way to analyze this amp is as a whole, when you listen to it, it's just addictive. I mean, there's amps, like I say, that you can't listen to with certain speakers for very long. There's some that you can, there's some that you want to. This is an amp that you want to. And it's more than just an amp, actually. It's a preamp and it has a phono stage. And Tim DeParavinci was known for creating great phono stages. I can't attest to the phono stage because I don't have a vinyl rig, so that's another reason why I'll give props to Steve Gutenberg and defer to him. He tested it out, and I think he gave it great marks, and it's got me tempted to hook up a phono stage to it. So, again, when there's somebody that can do this job even better than I do, I don't have any problem giving props. And like I said, that. Steve Gutenberg, gives, I give him a thumbs up now, and I was wrong about him the last couple of years probably to ignore him because at least on this piece, I think that we see eye to eye, ear to ear, and uh, that's something of value I would encourage you guys to uh, check out. And it's really not about, there's so much drama among YouTubers and reviewers and passive aggressive stuff. You know, really, the way I look at it is much differently. Uh, I usually don't even talk about other reviewers and whatnot, but in maybe in the membership section we talk a little bit sometimes when a topic comes up, mainly drama. But really all we are different people in the hobby is just like different artists. There's genres for pop music, there's genres for country western, rap, jazz, classical, whatnot. You know, I fit on a different uh, profile of my niche than somebody like um, Steve Gutenberg or Cheap Audio Man, you know, diff he's like they're like pop artists. I'm like a different type of artist. We all can appreciate what other can enjoy, and you as the audience can enjoy pop music, jazz, fusion, whatever you, niche you want. It's not about trusting one person and these people that get up in front to trust me for everything. Don't listen to anybody else. Only listen to me. Those are the ones you got to look out for. What I encourage you to do, listen to all these other YouTubers. Uh, cheap Audio Man, I'll give a quick prop to him, little deviation. When I was looking for amps to pair with this, because I was going to create a whole different system with this amp, like in my bedroom or office, and uh, the, looking for efficient speakers, the word clips came up. And so again, YouTube, what did I get as a recommended video? Cheap Audio Man reviews clips Cornwalls. So I decided to watch it. I hadn't watched him since he used to do live streams with the new record day guy. That's literally the last time I'd seen him. Although, no, he did one video about audio files are full of crap or something like that. I watched part of that. That was more clickbait stuff. Uh, but he does a great job. He does the Mr. Beast formula with thumbnails. He's grown. I couldn't believe how many subscribers he's got in just a short time. He knows how to work YouTube perfectly. You know, in terms of a pop artist, you know, he's the Taylor Swift. He does a great job uh, with, with his niche uh, for audio files. And I have to give him props when I watch that review. I think he gets a bad rap. A lot of people say, oh, he's not an audio file. He doesn't know. He only does cheap stuff. Well, yeah, I don't agree with him about Clips Cornwall being the best speaker I've ever heard. Uh, but it's more than that why you want to watch that review. At least when I watched it, I got a good impression for what he values. He mentioned songs. He mentioned different things that, you know, I probably should do in this review for here. I should bring up some of my playlists and tell you what I heard with uh, this this uh, amp and do that kind of stuff. I just don't have the patience to do it. Maybe I'll do it in the future. Certainly, if you come over, we can play different tracks and I'll do that. But uh, these guys do a much better job of those thorough reviews. And at least with the Cornwalls, I got a better impression that, you know, we may not hear ear to ear 
uh, and agree, but he does a, a very quality job, I thought, and gets a bad rap. So again, it's more about giving props to these guys. And for you, I think it's important for you to listen to all these different people because the more you listen to, the more you're going to realize some of them are insecure and just want you to listen to them and for a reason. And some of them, the value is to listen to all of them and you'll figure out on your own, okay, I sync with this guy. I, I sync with what he does. Eventually, you're going to do like I've done review a similar piece, hear a similar piece, and hear the same things. And that's where you're going to want to focus your attention on. So hopefully you hope to find that helpful. Hope you find this review helpful. I may do a part two or three. I've only had it for a short time period, but I thought it was so important to share this with you. Oh, one thing I wanted to show you. On top of that, this has a great uh, remote control. This isn't an Apple remote. This is actually aluminum. And the buttons are very big easy all you need to have volume control and mute it would be nice to be able to change the input but how often are you changing the input from your seating position if you're going to go to albums or lps you're going to have to get up anyway to uh, put an album on so you can switch the dial easily there and also one thing that's really cool about the chassis let me talk about that real quick very hot at the top okay you can fry an egg on the top the lighting though is super cool it's subtle but the blue uh, lettering matches the blue lighting perfectly. This half moon light, power on light, very subtle, cool. But the real key is these lights behind the dials. And so when you're from a distance, sometimes even LED displays, you can't tell what number. Uh, two looks like a four or eight, you know. Um, they're so small you can't tell. Just from a distance, I can tell on the dial where the volume control is. And same thing with the input selector. And then there's an input... A button, this extra button that wasn't around for circa 1985. You can actually tr uh, add or subtract the gain, the preamp gain stage an extra 10 dB. So like I showed with Angela Gilbert Young and his variable gain control on his amp, it's extremely valuable because sometimes you buy an amp that has too much gain for your speakers and then your volume control is at full volume at 10 o'clock and you've got very little control. Here you have a button, not a variable, but at least 10 dB you can swing either in or out the circuit and then get yourself more control um, or more gain if needed with the volume control. That's super innovative. Uh, so even though this is based on 1985 circuitry, it's got a tape loop still, uh, auxiliary inputs, all kinds of inputs that you would see back in the 80s, but it's got modern stuff too. And more importantly, modern parts, better transformer, uh, they give you a little more oomph. It's got a sliding scale, uh, sliding bias to B, to I think give you extra oomph than the 85 circuit did. In any case, it's a product that for this price point, there's nothing that gives you a phono stage, preamp, and amp anywhere close that I can recommend, even close to this. And yeah, multiple times the price. I want to compare this in a blind test to a lot of people on certain, at least efficient systems. That to me is going to be the ultimate litmus test and the ultimate review of this product when we blind test people with mega dollar amps. So anybody interested in doing that in the Houston area, let me know and I'll do a follow-up video. And maybe I can do more in the future depending on your feedback, how much more you want to know. Let me know questions that you have. Again, I've had so much experience with this and I do these reviews. I'm doing this off the cuff. I'm not going to edit anything. So I'm sure I'm leaving stuff out. Uh, so feel free to ask questions. Sign up, subscribe if you haven't already. And I'll see you back here soon with a lot more.